there's this idea, there's, there's sort of two different paths you can go down when you're building an app, whether it's uh, Greenfield or Legacy. You can end up just being a real magpie and going for every new shiny thing that you see and end up with something that's completely unmaintainable uh, because you're constantly repairing kind of weird collisions that nobody else has seen before. Or you can never ever change anything uh, and end up writing COBOL on mainframes uh, using waterfall. So what, what I'm sort of talking about is this idea of de-risking uh, development uh, and steering in between you know, kind of upgrade items and the unpredictability of uh, you know, when you've got many, many new shiny things in your stack, it's very easy to just have a completely unpredictable time for any given task uh, versus just getting completely stagnant, not being able to attract good devs, not having any fun working on the thing. So how you sort of steer a path between that. Um, so the, the, the idea I've been kind of working on is this idea of a novelty budget. You kind of work out upfront what your capacity for risk is, what your capacity for new stuff is. And this is going to vary heaps depending on the project. You know, if you've got something you've got to deliver in a week's time for cash, you're probably going to have an incredibly small novelty budget. It's going to be all text that you've used before and you're completely comfortable with. If it's something you're doing on the weekend because you want to learn some stuff, they'll throw, throw everything at it. If it doesn't actually need to finish, if it's just a test bed, you need to learn stuff, um, then you, you might as well just throw everything you want to it. So that first step is kind of uh, taking into account how big your novelty budget is. Once you've got that, it, it's worth talking about uh, what you might want to spend it on. There's always going to be some area where you're going to get a, a much bigger return on the weird stuff you're going to put in there. And conversely, having chosen that, like for me, qu quite often the novelty budget is Haskell. You know, I'll choose Haskell and say, all right, you know, I know there isn't going to be as much help on Stack Overflow. I know every now and then I'm going to have to write a library myself. Uh, and I kind of accept that, but that means like the whole rest of my stack is just as boring as I can possibly make it. You know, it's Postgres, it's Linux. Uh, even within Haskell, the, the kind of the frameworks I end up choosing uh, will tend to be, you know, I'll use Sode rather than Servant, even though Servant's got really, really cool type driven stuff, uh, because I know I'm not going to hit a problem in Sode that I can't fix. Uh, I don't try, I don't use all of the extensions I possibly can. Uh, as much fun as they can be because you're going to end up with type errors, especially if anybody else is working on it, type errors that you might be able to fix and nobody else can. So this idea of kind of consciously limiting uh, the, the set of uh, normal stuff you're willing to deal with. And you'll see this if you go to C++ shop. Nobody uses the whole language. You know, they, they cut it down to some set. It's like, all right, here's our dialect. Here's what we're comfortable working in. You can't use this other stuff. It might compile, but it won't be uh, understandable for anybody else. So there's this question also of what it applies to. You know, the, the idea of a monthly budget, it's not, not just about the languages you choose, it's the libraries within it, it's the databases you choose, uh, extensions, like I said, but also dev processes. You know, there's all these you know, new modes of working. I, I guess Scrum's fairly standard now or at least some kind of agile process. Uh, but there's also stuff like more programming. You know, um, talked about the Lambda Conf, you know, just seven people all clustered around a, uh, you know, a laptop. If you're going to do that, maybe don't use a cutting edge database or a link down fly store was writing your own Bayesian analyzer to see, to, to assign jobs to workers, uh, jobs to programmers rather than just using something like GitHub issues. You know, it's like, uh, unless that's the apps, unless that's where you're getting a massive return from it, it's, it's probably not worth it. You always can have one area where you, you want to go really hard uh, and get a lot of return from it. The rest of it basically just needs to be confident. So um, the way this applies to my stuff in Haskell is, again, usually use your SOAD. I would probably go for persistence and Escalito as a basic type safe SQL alike, uh, rather than the fancier stuff like Opali, um, and yeah, not going completely crazy on uh, type family stuff, this kind of thing. So yeah, forgive you, that's a, a fairly poorly organized talk, but I hope the, the juice came across.
Um, I'd love to hear if, if you've got any suggestions for, for dealing with this kind of problem and how you work it on, on in a bigger environment. Yeah. I'm curious how you feel about actual software architecting techniques to also help along with this. So things like microservices, serverless, componentizing, you know, all your front end, hexagonal design, whatever the flavor of the month is, you know, splitting up your application as much as possible so that when you do yeah. choose one of these like flavor of the month type things, it's gonna be isolated and used. Uh, I'm gonna have a typically type prejudiced response and say it's because really people don't have types. Uh, I think that's the major point of microservices in that you know it actually forces you to have a contract and a boundary. If you have an actual type, that's an actual contract, and it doesn't matter you know where the process boundary is so much. You know you, you can do that much later. You can defer that decision. Right. I mean, in this case, then you, you still like for a lot of us choosing Haskell's language is going to be a big jump. Yeah. So isolating that. That's it, it's certainly one way of uh, incrementally bringing it in, certainly. Yeah, and, and you may not have the option of saying, okay, let's have a big bang Haskell rewrite um, and not have a running code base for three months or whatever. But, um, yeah. As a design principle, I don't like it very much, but that's just my prejudices. Mm -hmm. Are you guys now tracking this budget? Or no, this, this is the next stage I'm thinking about. Like, I, I'm doing it in a very informal sort of way, sort of thinking, okay, I, I'm not, I've already made this one big leap um, in terms of production work. I'm trying to be as conservative as possible in the other one, but I, I think there might actually be some value in doing something like planning poker, you know, how, how, how weird do we think this tech is? How, how untested or, or like that. And you know, the whole thing about novelty budget is it's not an objective thing in some sense. It, it includes the makeup of your team and the skill of your team. Like using doing Haskell for a new projects kind of a new brand, a no brainer for me now. Um, might not be if you you know you have to learn it as you go along. So. Yeah. so I wonder your opinion because I'm in the process of rewriting but I kind of use both plus and that using Haskell for work anyway. Um, so when I bring in a new like technology, C++ is a very moving target to have features in languages. Yeah. That I that I put, um, I always try to test the subset. So if I say, oh, I want to use this, you know, template programming style here, how fast can I show a subsystem working with with real data that's in the system? So that they, they kind of prove out um, the idea that they're really working. So that's, that I'm in the process of doing that now. Kind of like yeah. where, I, where I prove it. Does it, it, does it, is it doing what I want it to do? Yeah. Or actual. Yeah, I mean, that's, inc that's incrementalism again. Isn't right. it? It's trying to, and that's another way of de risking it, I think, you know, of having a pilot project. That, that's a good point. I'll probably talk about that in my, my blog now. Totally going to steal that. Yeah. Is it uh, difficult to find pe people that, that know Haskell or? No, the, it, it's, here's the thing though, it's difficult to find people in your town. So, you know, uh, uh, just I'm a lot more. Well, no, I, I just mean that, you know, if, if you're not in San Francisco, New York or Boston, you know, you're probably gonna have a little bit of a, a hard time. So a, a lot of the Hasselors I know work remotely. I, I work remotely for a firm in Boston um, you, you can get, it, it is strange, like we, we hired for a, a front-end password using GHCJS uh, at my last company. I think we got something like 170 applications. It's Local? Local? Uh, no, that was, a, that was a remote view. So uh, that was an Australian company anyway, just based in the US, sort of. We didn't have offices you could go to, so it's sort of remote by default. But, um, so it's, it's not too hard to hire Haskells, I think, but yeah, you might not find them exactly where you are. But again, you know, if you've got maybe one or two high-level Haskells and, you know, one of their jobs is training, I think that can work well too. Yeah. I'm curious, have you read much about more traditional risk management systems? 
kind of theory. theory. Not just all this completely talking about. Yeah. I mean, it's, you know, we, we keep reinventing the wheel over yeah. and over and over. But I mean, a lot of this kind of like looking at a thing and figuring out, you know, in this system, you know, how much risk are we willing to take? Because taking on new stuff is, can just be more about the risk. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's a lot of interesting theory out there on that, going back to like the 40s and 50s. Okay. Um, I want to talk to you about that later, actually. Just, um, one of the things, the, the only reason I'm running the post of the first place is I kept referring to this concept and maybe seemed to know what I was talking about. And I, it is something I've, I've just been talking about for other programs for, with for a long time. So I just wanted something to refer to. Are there any tools that are doing while you're testing the new method? I mean, it, most of it is engineering papers written in the like 50s through 70s. Yeah. So, like systems engineering stuff. A lot of it is actual physical hardware. Sort of thing because you know it used to be that, and a lot of these processes were all about putting bottlenecks in the way so that you could, you know, ensure that things were not going to kill someone. I do think you want to be careful about trying to pretend that programming is engineering to some extent because it, it just isn't. You know, we don't have that that bedrock of safe practice and you know standard ways of doing things. Think but I mean, well, I agree. I think that there are some interesting things from that we don't think about as much. Like there are certain systems, like if you have you know, if your database of credentials, it's yeah. computer authentication, or you have like healthcare records or stuff like that. Yeah. You know, there are things where we can treat them more in that sort of traditional way, which that's true. I mean obviously if you're like doing the front end of a website, besides you know like cross site scripting concerns and things like that. Whatever, go nuts, who cares? Like if a button breaks. Well, well, what I'm kind of saying is, don't go nuts. Well, maybe I do care. Oh, you don't know. I mean, I mean, I mean, go nuts as in like, like the 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 risk in terms of damage to the company or users or whatever is relatively low. Right. However, there's still going to be a risk in terms of long-term maintainability. Like, yeah. Yeah, there's a lot. I should probably go into sort of the different kinds of risk here because I mean that's it. You know, you've got if you move too slowly, you've got that risk of stagnation. You move too fast, and everything's just broken all of the time. Yeah. Anyway, that's pretty much all I had to say. Unless anyone's got comments. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. yeah, let's have a five minutes break. Grab some food. Grab some beer. Go Cheers. Go to people, and we start in five minutes with the next talk. Thanks. Whoa. Thank you.